Hello, my name is Michael Trower. I'm an emergency medicine consultant, and now I'm going to show you how to do a FAST exam. So what is a FAST exam? Well, it's an acronym. It stands for Focused Assessment with Sonography in Trauma. And the traditional FAST exam just looked for peritoneal and pericardial fluid. However, it's now been superseded by the E-FAST or Extended FAST, which adds in an assessment for pneumothorax and hemothorax. So in terms of advanced trauma life support, the dogma is that any hemodynamically unstable patient plus a positive FAST exam should go straight to the operating theater for a laparotomy. Now, in reality, there's a bit more nuance than this, but certainly a positive FAST exam in an unstable trauma patient should make you concerned that this patient has internal bleeding. How do we perform a FAST exam? Generally, we use the low frequency curvy linear probe and we keep the probe marker to the patient's head or the right. And there are five regions we assess. First, the right upper quadrant. Second, the left upper quadrant. Third, the pelvis. Fourth, the pericardium. And finally, the anterior chest for pneumothorax. And we'll go through each of these steps in turn. So the right upper quadrant. So, have the probe marker to the patient's head. Place the probe in the mid to anterior axillary line and find a window between the ribs. So you may need to slightly rotate the probe so it's more parallel to the ribs to get rid of any rib shadows. Then, once you've found your window, fan the probe anteriorly and posteriorly. So you're keeping the footprint of the probe planted and you're just moving the back of the probe anteriorly and posteriorly. So you're really beaming through this whole region. Here's an image of a normal right upper quadrant. So at the back of the image is the spine, at the front is the liver, and in between is the kidney. To the patient's head, to the left of the screen, is the diaphragm. And in between the liver and the kidney is the potential space, which we call Morrison's pouch. Here's a video of a normal right upper quadrant. So you can see the operator is fanning through from anterior to posterior. So there are four main areas where free fluid can accumulate around the right upper quadrant. First is the hepatorenal space or Morrison's pouch, so between the liver and the kidney. But we also need to slide up to look between the liver and the diaphragm in the subphrenic space, slide down to the inferior pole of the kidney, and also slide right up into the thorax to look for hemothorax. Here's a video of a normal right upper quadrant with the liver to the left of screen and the kidney to the right. Now the operator is fanning anteriorly and posteriorly. And then we're sliding up into the thorax. So you can see the diaphragm coming into view there. And then we scan all the way down to check the inferior pole of the kidney. So it's a whole region that we're scanning. Here's a video of a patient with some black around the liver. So in ultrasound, black is fluid. In ultrasound terminology, it's called anechoic, so no echoes, because ultrasound passes very easily through fluid. It doesn't cause any reflections. So on ultrasound, it looks black or anechoic. So here's another video of the right upper quadrant, but this time we've slid slightly higher up into the thorax. So you can see there's a black area above the diaphragm in the thorax, represented by the blue cross. And also the spine behind it has become visible so normally you don't see the spine in the thorax because the lung is full of air and doesn't allow transmission of ultrasound. But in this case, because the fluid is allowing the ultrasound to pass through, we see the spine in the thorax. And this is called the spine sign. Okay, so that was the right upper quadrant. Now we move on to the left upper quadrant. So again, have the probe marker towards the patient's head. And this time it's a little bit more posterior and superior. So you have the probe a little higher up and a little further back. Again, find a window between the ribs, so you may need to rotate, so you're a bit more parallel to the ribs. And then once you've found your window, you then fan anteriorly and posteriorly. So just like in the right upper quadrant, we're fanning through, shining our torch all the way through that whole region. Here's an image of a normal left upper quadrant. So we have the spine at the back, the spleen at the front, and the kidney in between, and then the diaphragm towards the patient's head. Just like with the right upper quadrant, there are several areas where free fluid can collect. The main 
area in the left upper quadrant is actually above the spleen, so in the subphrenic place between the spleen and the diaphragm. But just like on the right upper quadrant, we also look between the spleen and the kidney, the splenorenal space, the inferior pole of the kidney, and we also slide up to look for a hemothorax on the left. Here's a video of a normal left upper quadrant. So we have the spleen at the top of the screen and the kidney at the bottom. And now we're fanning through from anterior to posterior. Now we're going to slide up towards the thorax to look for any hemothorax and then slide down to look at the inferior pole of the kidney. So again, we're scanning through a whole region. Here's an example of a patient who has free fluid. So you can see the black or anechoic area between the spleen and the diaphragm. Okay, the third component of the EFAST exam is the pelvis. So, place the probe just above the pubic symphysis. Often you have to tilt quite steeply down into the pelvis. So it's not straight across the abdomen like this, but actually tilting the probe down towards the patient's feet. Start in a transverse orientation with the marker to the patient's right. And then rotate the probe through 90 degrees so the marker is to the patient's head. And in each of those planes, again, we fan through. So we're shining a torch all the way through this whole region, not just getting one single image. So in the pelvis, fluid tends to accumulate in the recto-uterine pouch in females, also known as the pouch of Douglas, or the recto-vesical pouch in men. Here's an image of a normal pelvis, so in transverse plane, and we're fanning through from superior to inferior. And here's a video of a normal pelvis, this time in the sagittal plane, so we're fanning laterally. In this image, we can see there is a small amount of free fluid, as marked by this yellow arrow here. And again here, this time in the sagittal plane, again, we can see a small amount of free fluid. Okay, so the fourth component of the EFAST exam is the pericardium. So place the probe marker to the patient's right, Place the probe just below the ziphy sternum and then flatten the probe right down so you're almost pressing the probe down into the patient's abdomen. You're using the liver as a window to shine the beam up towards the patient's head rather than straight down towards their spine. There are a couple of things you can try to improve your view. So first have the patient bend their knees which will help relax their abdominal muscles and also have the patient take a deep breath in. As the diaphragm comes down this will push everything lower down and help you visualize it. Here's an example of a normal sub sternal view. So at the top of the screen is the liver, then we have the right ventricle and right atrium, and then the left ventricle and left atrium. And there is no fluid around the heart. On this example, however, there is a black stripe denoted by the red arrow and then there's also some clotted blood denoted by the blue arrow. So this patient has blood in their pericardial space or hemopericardium. Okay, so the fifth and final component of the EFAST exam is the assessment for pneumothorax, so the anterior chest. So air rises to the highest point in the body. So in a supine patient, we look at the anterior chest. So place the probe in the midclavicular line in the third, second or third intercostal space. You can use the low frequency probe, but it's actually better to switch to the high frequency probe so you get better resolution of the pleural line and you can see pleural sliding better. Have the probe marker to the patient's head, and this is what you'll see. So we have ribs on either side of the image. You can see the pleural line just deep to this, and we can also see another horizontal line deep to the pleural line, and this is called an A line. So A line is normal, it's just an artifact. So when the ultrasound beam comes down from the probe, it bounces off the pleural line, goes back to the probe, but sometimes it will go down again, bounce off the pleural line again and come back to the probe. And all the machine knows is that it's taken twice as long for the ultrasound beam to come back, and so it thinks it must be twice as deep. So it plots another line, the same distance again, deep to the pleural line. So this is just a normal artifact. Okay, so pleural sliding. So this is normal. When the visceral and parietal pleura are together and there's no pneumothorax, you see a shimmering movement along the pleural line. Sometimes you can see little vertical lines coming down off the pleural line as well, which are called comet tails. So if you see pleural sliding, you know there's no pneumothorax at that point. If there's no sliding, it could be a pneumothorax, but to make sure, you slide the probe posteriorly 
to look for the lung point, the transition point from no sliding to normal sliding. In this video, there is normal lung sliding, and you can also see a couple of little comet tails coming down from the pleural line. Just a few millimeters, bright white vertical lines coming down from the pleural line. In this video, the pleural line is not sliding at all. It's completely static. And even though the patient is trying to breathe, we can see the muscles moving. That pleural line has no shimmering movement across it at all. So there's no pleural sliding. So the next thing to do would be to slide the probe posteriorly to look for the transition point from no sliding to sliding, which is called the lung point, which is what we can see here. So on the left side of the screen, there's no sliding. And on the right side of the screen, there is sliding. This is called the lung point, the transition point. And this relates to the point in the chest where the lung comes up to meet the chest wall. So everything we've talked about up till now has been on B mode or brightness mode, but you can also use M mode to assess the pneumothorax. M mode just stands for motion mode. So imagine you've just isolated a single crystal from the center of the probe, and we're only interested in what's going on down that single line and it assesses for movement along that line over time. So in the top left image, the green line that goes through the pleural line is isolating that single crystal down the middle of the probe. And then the bottom left, we can see what's happening along that line plotted out over time. So the red arrows point to the pleural line in both the B mode and the M mode image. So in normal lung, above the pleural line, you get horizontal lines that kind of look like the waves of the sea but below the pleural line, you get a more speckled grainy image, which looks a bit like sand. And so this is called the seashore sign. This is normal, and it means there's no pneumothorax at that point. On the images on the right, again, we've got the green line going through the pleural line, so assessing for movement over that line over time. But in the image on the bottom right, the M mode image shows there's, no, there's none of that speckled uh, sandy appearance below the pleural line. It's just horizontal lines all the way down. And so this is called the barcode sign. How accurate is ultrasound for pneumothorax? Well, sensitivity is okay, 75%. If you can find a lung point, it's very specific, 98%. Importantly though, it's more accurate than a supine chest x-ray for pneumothorax. So there are some false positives with EFAST. Patients with ascites, can have positive fast exams because you'll see free fluid in their abdomen. All females who are mid-cycle, you can get a small amount of physiological fluid during ovulation. In terms of the lung, if the patient has COPD and some bullous disease in the apices, this can also cause reduced sliding. So how do we use EFAST in practice? Well, to be honest, it depends a lot where you work. In trauma centers, often patients are taken away to CT very quickly. But in some other DGHs, especially if CT is not co-located with a &E, there can be a significant delay getting to CT. And so a point of care ultrasound can give you a lot of really useful information very quickly. Take home point for today, FAST is a rule in, not a rule out test. If you're interested in learning more on this topic, there's a fantastic five minute video from Core Ultrasound. And then the POCUS Atlas also has a whole load of examples of pathology. Thanks very much for listening.